Can I just get one test from somebody to speak? Hello. Hello. Hey. Awesome. Um. So welcome to the team Q and A session. Uh, we have quite a few people in this uh, room, so hopefully it works fine. Um, just a quick round of introduction uh, to the people we have. We have uh, Leventa Poliak, the project leader of Archinux, also part uh, also the security team lead in um, and security team reproduce for builds. We have David, uh, Dave the Rave or something, which I learned recently his nickname is. He is the Arch system maintainer and had that talk at uh, 12 today. Uh, we have Jonas Witchell, which is a fairly recent TU addition. He works on the TPM and does a lot of the packaging on the TPM stack. Um, we have James <laughs> Allard, his name is. Uh, he's the... Um, He's one of the uh, Archwiki maintainers. He also writes AOR utils and does also some RCOP stuff. We have uh, Philippe Lines, also called FFY00. Uh, he does packaging mostly on some Arduino stuff, microcontrollers that I can recall. Um, we have Sven Storo. He does uh, infrastructure stuff. Um, and uh, in general, does is a developer and does packaging. We have Green Carlo Rasolini, which is an Arch developer, uh, maintains MK init CPO and uh, packages a lot of stuff. It's a bit hard to <laughs> remember what everybody's doing. We have Jelle van der Wa, uh, which does uh, is a developer, uh, works on the security team, reproducible builds, and uh, Arch web maintainer as well, if I recall correctly. And uh, we also have Bruno Pagellini, uh, also called Archange, but I um, think he's dropping a little bit in and out of the sessions. We'll see what happens. And then lastly, you have me, um, Fox Baron, also Martin Linderu. I do security team stuff, um, reproduce of builds. I also organize this uh, conference and sort of producing the entire thing, which is why I have the nice camera. So yes, um, hopefully this is working fine. This is the first time trying something like this. Uh, so I hope um, this will be interesting. So we'll just try. Um, we have, I see the single angel has been doing a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, questions. So we'll just take the round table ones first to get things started. Uh, what's the most fun or interesting part working slash being part of the Arch Linux team? Um, anybody wants to start? Hands, raise a hand. So Jelle, what's, what's the most interesting part? For me, the most fun was uh, meeting everybody at the conferences at FOSDEM, CCC, uh, at ArchConf. Last year in Berlin. Oh yeah, it was fun. And doing things together. So that, that was the most fun. But the question was, I guess, the most interesting, right? Yes. Uh, well, well, you know, everything's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, generally, uh, conferences are great fun doing the CCC part. Yeah. Fostem is great meeting people. Uh, there was also Dev Room. Um, I'm sure if anybody else has some, something else to add on the uh, being part of what's FOSS fun. If Leventa, Leventa wants to speak, yes. Yeah, basically, I just wanted to repeat the same because I still want to take a little bit focus on people because we are not just the technology, we're actually people behind the technology. So for me, it was also meeting people at the conference and then having not just nicknames behind some work, but actually places and persons. So mm. I agree. With that. Yes, uh, David. Uh, yeah, the social aspect for sure, but also um... In general, I think it was really interesting to find uh, quite like open spaces um, for things to be improved. You find projects that uh, that you see like, oh, nice, oh, I, c I can fix that, and then suddenly 
you maintain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always not always a good thing, but uh, it surely is is uh, is also it's very interesting and and uh, a great feeling that you can actually contribute and, and change something mm -hmm. that is of value to not only yourself, of course. Yeah, uh, personally, I think one of the most interesting part is uh, you sort of work on this sort of in isolation, but there's you rarely sort of have these kind of uh, conversation. So one of the more interesting parts is when we did the first uh, at the Chaos Communication Congress, the first uh, Q and A session we had live. Uh, I just at the organized self organization didn't promote it at well at all, but sort of it wound up having 150 people bum rushing to a room and uh, starting interacting. And it was a really interesting experience to just have that overwhelming feeling of, oh, wait, people actually appreciate the work you do. And then having a entire room full of 100 people clapping to the work you're doing on the free time. That's, I think that's, that's super, super valuable. Um, so you have a lot of questions. We just uh, continue. Um, we can we can probably do. Uh, is it worth becoming a TU if you want to bring one package only into the repositories from post factum? Anybody wants to answer? We can do Sven if you want to answer. Well, sure. Um... Frankly, probably not. It, I would say if you take a look at the repositories and maybe if you can find some orphans, we have tons of orphans and maybe outside contributors might not yet know about that. But mm -hmm. um, it actually turns out that um, we have some unmaintained packages. And if you were to go in and you know, we may be interested in picking some of those up, that would be great. And this would be a great uh, reason for you to become to you. Mm -hmm. Um, and anybody else has something to add or something you'd like to speak? Um, we can also, uh, pers uh, personally, uh, if you have some sort of uh, pet, not necessarily just one package, but a group of packages uh, with a common theme. Uh, we recently had, um, what is the name for elementary, uh, which Al no, so which Eli and the Shibumi sponsored, uh, Raster, um, Raster, which is one of the upstream maintainers of uh, Enlightenment, it is, I think, uh, which also is the joint uh, for, well, basically domain the uh, Enlightenment packages. Um, so is there any chance Arch will be doing Google Summer of Code and Outreachy in the future from Mescarun? Um, yeah, you can answer. Uh, last year we uh, applied for the Google Summer of Code, mm. uh, but we didn't get accepted. No. Um, this year I think we will try again. Mm. And but the well, the main not really issue. The main problem is that somebody really has to drive this mm. from our team, and the Google Summer of Code uh, requires quite a lot of time invested. Yes. Uh, investment from our side, which my yeah is is a tricky thing because we're all volunteers, right? So um, for outreachery, I think we also looked at this recently, and it requires I think us to sponsor somebody, um... uh, which but uh, the same thing. Um, applies we have we have to find the time to somebody from our team needs to take the time to submit everything and mentor somebody yeah so uh we also have some um texting question uh one will arch get debug packages uh from <laughs> alan and um, ramsey uh loaded question uh anybody wants to answer that one Uh, Levanta. Uh, I think in some regard, we are pretty close to that. We also have tried different approaches, mm. um, but it also depends at the end which which way we go. And there are also some technical challenges, uh, just to name one. Um, yeah. We, we use some split packages to also have different variants mm. uh, because it's actually not really feasible from a packager perspective to have multiple sets of uh, 
different things while they're still the same. And the issue which comes in mind is um, having the same path then, um, which leads to problems with debug packages. Uh, so I believe uh, if, if we go that way, then maybe we will get it when we have an alternative system in Pac-Man ready. Mm. <laughs> uh, Green Carly, you had something to add? Green Carlo? Okay, Alan, do you have something to add? So as far as I know, the thing of the debug packages, it was like limitations in DB script. So whenever we talk- Yeah, I wanted to mention that in the past few months, I have taken a look on, on the alternatives. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Is there a slight delay on you? I think Rosalyn has a slight delay on uh, on this feed. Uh, Alad, you can just continue, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, right. So uh, when we were always looking at the Git migration, hmm. which is like rewrite or adaptation of DB scripts, the thing with the debug packages was like always hmm. one part of it. So the idea was if we get the Git migration done, we would at the same time get the thing with the debug packages done. Hmm. And uh, it's been done more than a few times over like this year already. and. Uh, we like there was a new initiative in the last part one, but then it sort of lost momentum because of people working on it didn't have time and so on. So yeah, hopefully that will improve later. Yeah, I can also add a little bit on that. Uh, so I think Eli already did a quick patch uh, for DB scripts to have a, se a separate pool of, of uh, debug packages. We've also been sort of looking into how debug info D, uh, which is uh, sort of a debug package server you can connect to and sort of figure out how we can, if we don't distribute them, we can at least provide some way of retrieving the debug symbols. There are patches, but there still needs to be some work on the on that migration uh, path. So we have a question from Oak. Um, anything new on the seamless reboot free kernel updates? Uh, I think he's mentioning the kernel hooks, um, which would potentially like simlink and clear up the modules uh, library stuff. Um, anybody has something to add to that? Want to answer it? Uh, Leventa. Project leader, do you want kernel up seamless kernel updates? Do I need to answer now? <laughs> no, you can. I, there's been some movement in uh, in the bug report actually. Uh, I'm not sure if you follow it, but uh, there's been some recent. Um, I think one of the Linux from scratch auth book authors is uh, also contributing to that discussion. But yeah. Yeah, I'm also subscribed to that issue. I, I guess it still boils again down to actually having people on our team being interested in the topic. I mean, not just responding with ideas, but actual having some open discussion, which leads to some kind of implementation, which in my opinion is still lacking. Um, so as long as we don't have anyone who really wants um, to to work on this, um, I can't really do give any estimate on it either. Um, so uh, are there any plans to make Arch Linux available on Windows subsystem for Linux? I'm not sure. Um... There's been some discussion on that previously, but does anyone else, does anyone have something to add? Uh, yeah, Alad? So uh, it's been brought up a few times in the past, and basically there were like stuff like trademark issues, like mm. the Hodge thing showing up on the Windows Store <laughs> and whatever, and some weird image with all kinds of modifications and unsigned repositories and whatever. And in the end, it was decided that we like there would be no support for it. Like mm. not on the port, for example, like even on the Arch Wiki, the the WSL redirects to Arch Linux support only. <laughs> yes. So I don't see it happen. Yeah. And, uh, I believe part of that was both a trademark issue and there was also a issue in terms of uh, support because previously, at least on WSL one, uh, there was some patch to glibc and kernel stuff going on, and you'd have to essentially be supporting a. Uh, secondary system on top of, of it. Um, so let's see what we have in terms of 
questions. Uh, um, are there Arch developers trust users who use Arch in a work slash enterprise company context? I use it for a PXC booted rescue system on a few hundred machines, but I feel alone with this setup. So is there anybody out here that either deploys Arch in production at the work or use it for work stuff? Yes, Sven. Uh, I, I actually do um, quite quite a lot actually uh, and the reason is that well so I use it in, in multiple contexts um, so I work mostly for enterprise clients currently mm -hmm. and uh, it actually is quite the advantage to be able to get all the news uh, the most recent packages and especially when I do docker builds uh, and I use Arch docker uh, the official docker image actually quite a lot for for our CI just because it's faster usually uh, than like just getting the, the packages as opposed to you know using some Ubuntu image and then maybe hunting down some PPAs for some GCC whatever. Um, so yeah, that and it works really well actually. But I don't really deploy it on any scale. It's it's more like for for myself and for CI. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't give it to my colleagues, for instance. Yeah. Um... Why is there not a graphical inst installer on the ISO, uh, David? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a long uh, heated topic, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, mainly because no one has done it, um, and secondly, um, because there's often like a controversial around um, uh, what Arch should uh, should should be like. Um, I think over the past years it has kind of fall under this conception of Arch being this hard to install um, type of, you know, gateway, uh, gateway kind of thing where you, where you're not really, you know, have, a, have an easy time installing. And that's supposed to be like this because we kind of leave out the, the beginner users, etc. That's not really the reason. The reason is more like no one really spent time on this uh, Arch ISO. Uh, in itself has been unmaintained for a while and has been kind of bit rotting also a little bit. Um, and I mean, you, you basically need to really work on concepts to make this happen. And uh, this is something that um, there are initiatives for, but this, this requires time, of course, and also to get this right and not just randomly, you know, provide people with installers or something like that. It's a lot about like integrating from what we have now to something that makes sense from the standpoint in mm -hmm. which we are now. And um, yeah, it requires time, but it's uh, there's something in the pipelines at least. Yeah. Uh, so we can just continue that ha tangent. Uh, is there any plans to make the installation easier? You had to talk at 12, but uh, I can just continue on that same yeah. tangent. Yeah, in, in a way, I would like to see that a lot um, because it uh, it is an unnecessary bottleneck to some extent mm. um, to um, have manual steps um, or many of them um, that you script away then either way, which leads to like a gazillion of of like custom user based scripts that oh I, this is how I deploy my system and then you have hundreds literally hundreds of that stuff uh, fl flying around and no one really knows how that works. And if you try to debug that together with that said user that messed up his or her system with it, it's really hard to trace these steps, you know, to find out what, what actually happened, what went wrong, um, if you have no no way of tracing it. And uh, therefore, I think it would be nice to actually have some sort of like template-based uh, installation that makes this easy and also like, mm. um, traceable for, for us. Yeah. Um, and for the user. Uh, so we can take uh, Alad and then we can take Sven. Uh, so one maybe less known fact is that they're like, um, I, we had an installer in, until like 2012 and then one of the developers sort of took that project and continued it to Arch Boot, which is like some, so one of the Arch developers has one of these images. It doesn't always work. There was a time where it like didn't work for six months or something. So it's basically only a thing that you do if, like, if you know what you're doing or if you've called art normal way before, but like it's there. 
But, um, so that's sort of the more the, the classical approach that you'd have like 10 years ago, some menu that you click through. But uh, what David said on this template stuff, that's, I find that also interesting. Um, and I think like maybe last year or a bit more before that, there was like someone who, who proposed something like this. But I think there was like uh, one guy, some sort of, I think it was a bit comparable to Ansible, something like mm -hmm. that, like the, the infrastructure from Arch is also just Ansible to set up all the servers and so on. So I think that's also an interesting approach. But uh, I guess there wasn't really that much interested, interest in it to continue it. But there was also some other like uh, internal discussions on, on if you could use like some graphical projects or whatever to, to install stuff. But I think it's very much like still either there's not that much interest or it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Uh, Sven, did you have anything to add? Yeah, so I think probably the primary challenge is really that nobody really knows how an installer that is compatible with Arch philosophy would actually look like. And I think the primary or all the graphical installers that I know about, um, primarily Calamaris, they mostly focus or primarily focus on getting the system installed for the users quickly and without any friction. And now the thing that Arch has this uh, this air about it, that it's kind of elitist or hard to install. And it's really not that we try to keep this up. It's more like it has to be this way in order for us to be comfortable um, installing Arch that way, because it's, it means that we have the all of the customizability in our hands during the installation. And if we had an official installer that is graphical and everything, uh, it would have to follow in this, in this vein, in these steps. And so it's just something that this is, this is a problem pretty specific to Arch. And so we can't really copy from anybody else. Uh, and this is why it's conceptually so hard to come up with this. It's not like we are so opposed to graphical stuff. I mean, we're all running graphic environments, I think. But uh, you know, this is, this is just kind of the background on why this is so hard for us. Uh, Leventa? Um, yeah, I also agree on uh, what Sven said of it, that being hard. Um, but at one point, we also should at least a little bit reconsider and see how we could make things work. Because uh, right now, from an accessibility standpoint, uh, it really sucks. And we're excluding a bunch of people we really shouldn't exclude. Uh, so at least we should at one point, I guess, have really a discussion how we may want to approach some stuff and um, how to tackle those challenges, as uh, Sven mentioned. Hmm. Uh, Philippe, you had something to add? Uh, yeah, I, I have thought uh, in the past about uh, trying to to include the uh, accessibility features in the in the ISO. Mm. It doesn't need necessarily to to be a graphical uh, interface, but just uh, a, a simple voice to text mm. uh, setup, so that you you can just type the the commands and the is will type them, hmm. which I, I think will uh, increase the accessibility for a lot of users. Yeah, I uh, know. So um, yeah, the, the the problem I think it's just time. Yes, yeah. uh, I know. Uh, David has been talking with the talk uh, talk arch uh, maintainer about providing some more accessibility. So hopefully, some whole something gets done just in the base ISO. I'm just going to try. Uh, Move us a little bit uh, along. Um, so, what's the most challenging thing you've done as part of contributing to Arch? Um, does anybody want to answer? We can take. Uh, I'm not sure, I think Green, Green Carlo is uh, still sadly uh, uh, disconnecting, but we can take uh, Leventa. Um... So basically, it was also the reason why I started to get involved in art um, or more. Like, at, at one point, I was like, OK, we don't have a security team. Mm. And um, at, also, Ellen made a call for action on it. And I was like, well, OK, if there is none, but I really want to have one. If I'm using this distro, then, well, I guess I need to get involved and do it myself. And so this was basically my motivation why I stepped ahead. Uh, on that regard, and it was quite challenging creating something out of nothing. So, mm. um, Alan, well, I think the hardest part for me, like um, when I, when I joined or when I started using Arch in like 2014, 
there was this uh, for the installation, there were like two guides on the Arch Wiki. There was like a beginner's guide, which was like a very huge detailed guide for which was like 40 pages long. And then mm. it was a very short installation guide, which was like maybe two pages and almost like contained a very limited amount of information. So what I did, it took like two or three years was to like put these two guides together. And I think that were like very challenging part because you have to like adapt to two audience now, like uh, one part of the user base audience wants to like uh, just read some page and uh, adapt these instructions, uh, like very general uh, instructions without like having to necessarily like choose some specific option that is best for them, but just like some generic recommended option. And then the other uh, part of user base wants to like have maximum flexibility and choose everything on their own and read everything and whatever. Mm. So you have to like now we have like one guide for both of these audiences. So the, the one thing it meant is that the actual articles in the wiki would have, would have to be much better because like five or six years ago, there was a lot of information in this, in this beginner's guide, right? In this very long page. And there was not a lot of information sometimes in other pages or like not very organized. So we had to like adjust all kinds of pages to have more details so that they would work from a, like from a smaller guide. Hmm. And that, that took a lot of time and effort and, and discussion with, with other community members. But uh, in the end, I think it worked out for the most part. So, yeah. Uh, die bonus? Um, yep. For me, it's not really, so one huge challenge, but I think the nice thing about Arch is that you actually, um, in your day-to-day -day life, always encounter situations where you, where you don't really know what to do um, because some, some package updates doesn't uh, mean it doesn't build anymore at all. And I think the nice thing is that you always have uh, some people to, to rely on to, mm -hmm. to ask how, how to do that. And I think it's a great opportunity to, to learn new stuff. So uh, if you want to, to get involved, don't, don't think it's, it's too hard. I could never do that. Just find something you want to contribute to and you will uh, well learn on the go. Hmm. Uh, so you can move a little bit forward. Uh, how much time are you devoting to art development? And do you have day jobs related to programming slash development? Uh, who wants to take a stab at that? Uh, Alad? Well, for me, in, in, like this year, it was pretty hard to spend time in Arch because like now, now I'm doing my master in mathematics and uh, I had to move to a different country and all kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I think it's like, because we're all doing this in our free time, uh, sometimes it's sort of hard to take time away from your actual life and like have to spend it on Arch. And I think that's also sometimes why some projects like the thing with the debug packages sort of stall mm. because like people just like have a life or work of their own and then they can't always uh, spend it. Uh, invested to arch um so that's that's for me so like what i usually do is like when i have some extra days uh in some months like i usually take some extra days to spend a lot of time on it and then maybe some time after i might not spend so much on it and then i take another set of few days and spend a lot of time and so on so i'll sort of look at uh, at the time that i have and then when i have it i try to take advantage yes uh personally i do security engineer work as my day job, but a lot of my personal free time just spent devoted to Arch Linux. Like the conference has taken a few weeks to uh, organize along with my standard packaging maintaining. Uh, I Sven, I think, was first afterwards. I lost a little bit track of who is who. No, who's right? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just go ahead really yeah. quick. Um, so I spend I think about an average of like ten to twelve hours every week on Arch, so not quite part time, but um, you know, not quite nothing as well. Hmm. Um, and well, I I do much of the same stuff I do in Arch. I do uh, professionally, so it I suppose it kind of comes naturally, and uh, you know, it's probably kind of stupid to be doing the same thing that I do professionally in Arch, but I I don't know. Um, it, it works for me. Um, then it was uh, Philippe. Philippe, did you have anything to add? And it's silent. Um, 
you guys can still hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Uh, yeah. We, oh, you had Philip. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can hear me. So, yes. Yeah. Now we can hear you. You don't need to be muting me because I, I'm muting myself. Mm. Uh, right. So uh, I spent uh, a few hours, but it depends on the, on the weeks and what I what I'm doing. If I am just updating packages, uh, or adding new packages, that sometimes that that actually requires. Uh, a big amount of time mm. if, if I have to pull a bunch of dependencies and make sure everything works together. But uh, yeah, so I am studying. Uh, it, uh, uh, so I, I, I do have a, a little bit of time to, mm. to contribute, but yeah, overall, even when I'm in school, I sometimes end up uh, doing art stuff in the background. Uh... So, yeah. We we can we can try. Uh, Grassellini has a has a six six seven second delay, but uh, we can try. Uh, we can see if we can get a answer for him as well. Uh, in how much time do you spend on Arch Linux? I'm not sure if you can hear me. If the delay is a little bit longer, uh, we can. Um... Oh. Yeah, guys, so I spend around, lately I have been spending around three to four hours on Arch weekly. Um, but, um, but yeah, I try, I try to spend around 10 hours per week. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little, it's a little hard to, to calculate how much time I would spend but uh, lately have been uh, quite difficult for me to spend more, right? But um, yeah, that, that's around it, three to four hours per week. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so let's see, more questions. Um, uh, what's the best learning lesson from contributing uh, Anthrax? Uh, so, for me, it's quite specifically at, and it is very far back in the uh, past. Um, but the biggest lesson I had is basically, um, I think there are different stages of evolution when you start contributing to open source. Um, and for me, the biggest uh, step was basically when you stop just opening bug records and complaining about stuff, but actually start fixing it yourself because um, well, it, it, it first, it helps open source most because you're actively contributing to it instead of just complaining about something. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it, it, basically, this is the way how you get your stuff fixed the fastest. Just do it yourself. And so this is the biggest lesson or, or learning, basically, I can give to everyone. Uh, stop complaining and start doing it yourself. <laughs> uh, and this, I think this is a nice segue also to the to the to another question, which is what drove you to join the Arch Linux team? And I, I think this is uh, uh, probably something few, many people share. They have some issue they want to solve or some sc scratch itch, and then they start uh, contributing. Uh, David? Yeah, that's basically one of the reasons why I started contributing to Arch because mm. uh, all of the Pro Audio stuff sucked uh, because <laughs> um, there was just no one maintaining it anymore. And mm. uh, I got really frustrated with that shit. So <laughs> eventually I just uh, applied to become a TU and uh, started fixing these packages and more and more of these packages either got dropped from extra to community and uh, well, now I have a lot of packages. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. not necessarily good, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's kind of nice uh, that this is kind of in better shape again now. Um, and I'll try to find uh, people actually to yeah help maintain this because this is something that surely is something that can be uh, dealt with better in a group than only mm. with uh, one single person. Um, and yeah, so if you're interested in packaging, there's a lot of audio stuff, a lot of multimedia stuff also that Arch has in the repositories that requires maintenance. And it's it's always better to have more than one person on it. Mm. Uh, and hopefully uh, with an eventual Git migration from SVN, where we have a lot of the packages on, on GitLab instead of the SVN repository, uh, where we have to attach 
uh, patches to bug reports or email patches to maintainers. Hopefully it'll be easier for people to get started maintaining stuff. Um, so stay tuned for that. It's going to maybe take a little while, but hopefully we, we, we get there. Um, ah, we can take an easy one. Okay, no, Ale, do you want to add something? I just want to add that uh, on the question with the installer, I was wrong on when Archboot uh, came out. So it was like uh, at least when, by 2008, uh, like Alan uh, linked the change lock in the IRC channel. Hmm. Uh, questions, questions, questions. Um... So how often do you guys update your systems? Uh, personally, I do it once a week and then I, I'm, I'm naughty. So I do partial updates with my kernels because I can't be asked to reboot that often, sadly, uh, but usually a weekly, weekly update. Uh, what do, what do other people do? Well, I personally do it basically daily. So when I, when I first set in front of my computer, the first thing I do to basically get awake is doing an update. So. Yes, that's all that's on brand considering your, uh, your, your polo shirt. Uh, Felipe? Uh, okay, so I, I try to update it at least uh, every couple of days. So make sure that, that I don't have like a big uh, backlog of packages to install. Mm. So uh then we can take uh, grassolini with a slight delay on answering eventually hopefully yeah so i try to update uh, data as well the only the only time I don't update is when there is some kernel update and I can't reboot right away. And I try to start my day by updating everything. But uh, the funny thing is, is, is that I have to update two machines because I use a VM for work. So so I have to update twice. That's the that's the thing. But uh, mostly it's updated. Hmm. Um, nice. Uh, and anybody else has something to add? Yeah, I just update every few hours, to be honest. You know, and, <laughs> <laughs> like, with, you know. with or without testing? Uh, with testing, I oh, always run. Yes. I think on all of... No, nope, I have one server that doesn't run testing. But apart from that, I mm. <laughs> update most of the time. <laughs> oh, um, yes. Uh, the perpetual updating of, of Arch Linux. Yeah, I, I am the meme, essentially. Oh, yeah. Um, so what's the first thing that people do when they get a fresh Arch install up and running? Uh, personally, I get my dot .files set up uh, and uh, fetch stuff from my backups from the previous computer and set it up. What do other people do? Somebody, Sven? Yeah, I also... Okay, my dot files is a is a good first one, but I think mm. actually I I transfer some SSH stuff that I need first, and then set up my dot files because I also need some files, and then usually some graphical environment, and then usually actually I'm set. Uh, Yella. I never reinstall. What's this madness? Oh. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's also perpetual arch installations uh, using the same hard disk and just DD it over and just boot it up, fix the FS tab, and you're good. Uh, some people, some people do that. We can take an interesting. Um, um, we can take an interesting question. Um, if Arch had a paid position, what would be the first position slash responsibility to use that salary on? So essentially, if we could pay someone someone to work on Arch, what would be sort of the most uh, critical or the things we should be solving, probably? Nobody has something to add? Yella? Switching the repositories to Git. Ooh. Uh, David? 
yeah, mainly infrastructure, I guess. Uh, that's always a good thing to improve. Uh, we have lots of kind of legacy systems that mm. we more or less want to get rid of. And being able to work on that full time would probably improve uh, that switch, I guess. Mm. Uh, Fasten it. Yes. Uh, Sven? Yeah, I think generally speaking, um, things that nobody wants to work on for free, well, things that just aren't fun, right? We do all do art for fun. And if things aren't fun, you need some, let's say, external motivation. <laughs> I would need Git migration. Okay, here's, here's like a thousand lines of bash code that you need to sort of figure out and solve. And, and that's that's not fun. That needs to be done. Uh, it's, it's slow. Um, what what would you tell yourself if you went back before you started contributing uh, and sort of what what would be your uh, words of wisdom to yourself Levanta? Uh, basically this is a little bit funny because um, I did quite a or I really was basically distro hopping back then. Mm. And uh, at least on my home machines, I was uh, running um, Gentoo, which basically I was super annoyed about compiling all the shit over and over and over again. So what I would t tell myself is um, go your path you are about to go, but don't do it because you stop compiling shit. Because oh. it turns out I now compile all the shit. So I, <laughs> at least... I'm pretty happy that it turns out like this, but I'm still compiling shit, so. <laughs> um, did somebody else have something to add? I'm not sure if I completely get all of the uh, hands ups. Nope, then we can continue with the next question. Um, how do you guys test package builds and man manage to maintain that many packages uh, in terms of do you use Arch, Root, and Spawns, QMU, other VM stuff? Uh, so I can just quickly, uh, personally, I just use the DevTools stuff with a little bit of custom scripting with AOR utils to sort of have uh, new dependency cycles tested before entering the community, but a lot of that is still just being built with NSpawn. Uh, somebody else has something to add? Anybody does something special with testing their packages? Uh, we can take David first. I do some testing on certain packages that are a little brittle and weird mm. uh, when they concern audio and so on, especially when, when it's packages that are like core feature packages such as Jack, et cetera, then usually I try to test this upfront. Uh, and I mean, sure, we also have the testing repository, but it's often much more interesting to test this locally, um, especially if it's something hardware facing, hardware bound that you can actually test on a real machine. Quite important to do that uh, yourself or mm. find someone to do it with you or for you. Um, we can take uh, the bonus. I should write this down. I don't. Yeah, apart from, I mean, basically, obviously, it's always good if you use your package yourself because then you realize when something's wrong but i have also found that just some basic sanity checking already goes some some long way so mm -hmm. if you just use diffoscope or just compare the the files you had in the old package versus the new package mm -hmm. and you see that a lot of stuff is missing then maybe there's something wrong so um, basically looking at your package before you even install it can can help fix a lot of problems that you miss because you didn't add a new dependency, for example. Yes, I will try Grassolini. I'm uh, poking him on RSC so we avoid delay. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so I tried to I try to 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 run I run testing and I try to make sure that uh uh I test everything on bare. There are a few things that I use VMs to test. So, for example, I use I use VMs to test MK and PAO and some other things. But basically, yeah, I run everything on bare. And I try to report guys because this is very important. I, I report uh, when something's broken mm. because we have very few tests, right? So, 
try yeah. to report everything. Cool. Uh, then we can take uh, Philip. Okay, so I just usually try to uh, check for the differences in in packages when I when I'm updating. I also usually always uh, uh, check the uh, a tree of the of the turbo uh, to make sure everything is fine, and then I just run it locally, make sure everything is working. I also try to to uh, keep myself updated on the changes in the upstream, so try to to know what went into the new version, what changed. So if something breaks, I I have an, an idea what the what might have caused it, and mm. this also helps with compatibility with other packages. So if something changed in some place, that can have side effects and uh, break other packages. So I try to to keep that in mind when updating. But generally, I just test uh, locally. Do, 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 do. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's sort of all the questions we had had time for. Uh, if somebody has any last words uh, for the viewers watching us live? No, nope. get involved, oh, guys. Oh, yes, get involved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's... Find something to work on and just get involved. Yes, email people, talk with them, RSC. Uh, Levante? Yeah, that's also what I always urge people to do. Um, we are all people behind the technology and we make the technology. So um, just stop complaining and start <laughs> doing it yourself. Uh, this is really the best thing I can uh, recommend to everyone. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it will be the best thing for you personally as well, because you get your your topics, the things you're very interested in fixed or uh, implemented. So just get involved, uh, mm -hmm. just help us. Yes. Um, so I think we'll take a round off there. I hope this was interesting. Uh, it's a little bit inter interesting doing this entire Q&A live uh, with all of the impulses and questions uh, from the chats. Uh, so yeah, now it's time for a break, a new DJ set, and we'll see you guys after the break.